What's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Basement Show. We got David Peppos here. He is the author of the upcoming OZ. Now, David, actually, is it the Oz or the OZ? You got it right the first time. It's the OZ. All right, because you call it the Occupied Zone. That's right. Now, what this is, is a reimagining of The Wizard of Oz. What happens after Dorothy left Oz after killing the Wicked Witch of the West and it basically just left the entire place in turmoil, in a political vacuum. Nobody ever considers that. Like, yep. <laughs> now there's going to be a power struggle. David, right. welcome to the show, man. Thanks for coming on. Salud. Oh, th thanks so much for having me. Uh, and yeah, thank you for the for the wonderful introduction. You really hit the OZ on the head. <laughs> I, I've really described it as, uh, what if Mad Max and the Hurt Locker took place in the Wizard of Oz? Mm -hmm. And like you said, we've recontextualized Dorothy Gale killing the Wicked Witch of the West. It's left a power vacuum. Oz has been in civil war for years. And uh, so our story picks up a generation later with Dorothy's granddaughter and namesake, who is a disillusioned Iraq war veteran. And she's come back from her time overseas with some real scars and some real trauma and some real heartbreak. And she's trying to put the pieces of her life back together when a tornado strikes her small town in Kansas. And this new Dorothy finds herself in the war-torn land of Oz. So she's going to have to really confront her, her past and her grandmother's legacy not to mention navigating her grandmother's former friends if she hopes to survive the occupied zone, mm. or as the locals call it, the OZ. So now I, I love reimaginings. The, yeah. it, like anytime somebody could take an existing character, especially like a classic character, like sure. any of the ones from the Wizard of Oz yeah. and just reimagine them into the most twisted way possible. I'm always game for this. Yeah, you have a Kickstarter going for yep. this, which is pretty much the purpose of this interview in the first place. <laughs> the original cover that you have has Dorothy with a reimagined Tin Woodsman, who yep. looks absolutely insane with that giant axe, and axe. he almost looks a little like Iron Giant-ish. Yeah, a little bit. A little, little Iron Giant, a little Iron Man, a little of the uh, uh, power armor from mm -hmm. Fallout. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, wait till you see uh, the Scarecrow. Wait till you see the Lion. Um, so uh, now that's actually what I wanted to ask you about. Uh, yeah. You said she, this new Dorothy, who is yeah. obviously named after her grandmother, yeah. she has to meet and really, come, first of all, come to terms with, holy shit, grandma wasn't crazy. This yeah. is all true. Yes. This is all real. The stories were real um, because as you see in our preview, things have not been great for the original Dorothy. She's, she's battling dementia. She's, she's, mm -hmm. she has Alzheimer's. And, and that's part of the reason why uh, her granddaughters come home is to try to take care of her. Things aren't and, so great for her granddaughter either, as you can yeah. see by right before she gets hit by the tornado. No spoilers, guys. Go check out the Kickstarter. It's but like yeah. she's got some tr she's got some issues. She's got some real she she's really kind of struggling to to find direction and, and to reintegrate. Um, but yeah, it's you know we one of the first things that our the original Dorothy with Grandma Dorothy says is has anybody fed the dog? And it's like this heartbreaking moment where it's just like oh, she still thinks Toto's alive, mm. um, and she's still telling these stories about you know Emerald Cities and Yellow Brick Roads and and Munchkins and 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 Winkies and and Wicked Witches and of course her granddaughter is just like oh it's grandma's stories again and her finding out that they're all true it's it's been really fun not just sort of you know inventing a new Dorothy kind of out of whole cloth uh, to make her kind of this really take charge and and proactive character but um getting to revisit those those touchstones mm. um you know. So have all of the characters, are are the Tin Woodsman, the Scarecrow, and the Cowardly Lion, or the Courageous Lion, as you call them, yeah. uh, are they all on one team, or are they actually different factions all fighting they, for control of Oz? You know, they haven't, they haven't seen eye to eye in a long time. Um, and that's kind of, that's one of the heartbreaking things about this story, is it's sort of, you have that fractured friendship, mm -hmm. and how can you patch that back up? Um, and you know, Dorothy, by virtue of who her grandmother was, she, everyone's looking to her for answers. She's sort of this catalyst. And I think that what we do in the OZ as our series progresses, um, uh, because really it is about sort of, it's, it's, it's putting these friendships back together. And that's sort of the, 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 the long-term arc over our whole series. Uh, it's going to be really cool. I, I think the, the way that we've, the twists on these characters we're able to kind of remix them in really fun and interesting ways that still speak to the original core spirit of these characters. So like the tin soldier, for example, um, you know, he's a guy who's been destroyed and rebuilt so many times with whatever scrap metals around that he's turned into this like towering war machine freedom fighter. And at the same time, he's a guy who wanted a heart. 
And so what happens to that heart when he spent years being the sole survivor on the battlefield, watching his friends die in front of him? What does that do to a man? Um, do you bury that heart or is it something that's always going to come back? Uh, the scarecrow, meanwhile, he was kind of the most complicated figure of the whole book. I, I had a really fun time getting into his head. Um, and the fact that this that, is that a, guy, <laughs> a little bit, a little <laughs> bit, um, you know, this is the guy who uh, he wanted to be smart. And yet the thing about smart people, you know, the, 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 you start to realize, oh, being smart isn't always the solution. Sometimes that just means you're the first one to realize how, how screwed everything is. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, you know, you listen to people like Elon Musk, where there's, there's that ego. Anybody who calls themselves a genius has that ego. And so, you know, what happens when you keep going back to the Rubik's Cube and you can't solve it? What does that do to you? Like, like how does that twist you and, and embitter you? Um, and then the lion, uh, who I guess, I guess with full disclosures, you know, the, the lion only has a very quick appearance in, in our first issue. He'll, he'll play more of a role in our second and third issues to come, but his story is one of legacy. I think he and Dorothy have a lot in common in that regard, where his story is very much about, you see these ideals of the past at which we always look at with rose colored glasses anyway. And then you get driven, you, you get dragged to the war and the muck and you start saying, you know, are these ideals, can we ever get back there? Or is that something that just like wasn't feasible to begin with or might not be feasible moving forward? Um, also, you know, the lion wanted bravery. He wanted courage. And how does that calculus change when you're not just fighting for yourself anymore? What happens when you're the king of the animal kingdom and you have a whole nation to think about? Mm. Um, you know, that's, I, I think that Dorothy will have a lot in common with him in that regard, because she is always going to be thinking about what's the morality of warfare. How do you make a just decision when every choice you make can wind up with someone dead? Right. And, uh, you know, she's already experienced this, uh, having, you know, survived Iraq and Afghanistan. And, uh, she's going to be really now that she's back in Oz or now that, that, she, that she has dropped into Oz, I should say. Um, she kind of sees it as a second chance to get things right. And so she's going to, you know, while this does bring her back, to these really horrific moments of her past. And we'll explore those as the series continues. She's going to also be thinking like, is there a better way of doing this? Like, is there a way to escape this cycle of violence or once, or is it when you're stuck in a war that you're just, you're stuck in it, uh, you know, uh, forever or until you've annihilated one side or the other. So aside from the tin soldier, the lion and the scarecrow who represent three separate factions, I have to ask, uh, we saw flying monkeys yep. in the preview, which yep. abso looks absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. uh, the bolo whip, which I love the fact that you put a bolo whip in there. That is like the quintessential 80s weapon. <laughs> and like just yeah. every kid knows like you wanted a bolo whip. That'll stop anybody. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. The, the, the winged monkeys uh, are, are particularly frightening. They, they answer to neither. Darwin, nor gravity, nor the Geneva Conventions. So are they uh, a faction in and of themselves, or are they just kind of running wild, not having the witch to command them? Yeah, I mean, you know, things have changed for them without having the Wicked Witch around, and they've they've taken up arms, <laughs> um, you know, and it's like, it, it's already, you know, monkeys in themselves, when they're on the ground, are dangerous, and then you add wings, and they are more dangerous, and then you add guns, and then they are really dangerous. Guns and explosives. So, yeah, uh, uh, Dorothy is going to have her hands full uh, dealing with these winged monkeys. Yeah, there's a lot going on in the Land of Oz, and I think that's that's part of it, and I think that's for me, and, and I, I appreciate you talking about sort of how you like seeing these these uh, classic properties be reimagined mm. with a darker slant. And for me, um, you know, and and I, I felt the same way with my first book, Spencer and Locke, is that uh, it's it's very easy to say, I don't know, that uh, Elmo's going to cook meth in Oscar the Grouch's trash can, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, and, and the count is going to be saying, you know, you owe me one, two, three stacks. <laughs> um, but like that, none of that's like supported in the source material, you know, like it's just edgy. And, and, and the thing is, I, I, for me, just being edgy, just shocking for the sake of shock value, that'll get your foot in the door once, uh, but it won't sustain. Uh, you know, people will look at the car accident once, but nobody comes back for seconds. Right. So for me, it's always, it, does the source material justify my thesis? Um, is there a, a deeper characterization that I can get into? Um, just to make sure that it's not, 
it's not just a punchline that like that we're treating the characters with uh, empathy and compassion because that way I feel like ultimately we're treating our readers the same way mm. uh, because there are people who you know have dealt with mental illness and PTSD and um, and I never want to punch down on them but uh, yeah for the OZ it was just you know if you've ever read the L Frank Baum novels or if you've I actually ever watched, haven't or if you've watched the Judy Garland film which is kind of like you know everyone has cultural yeah. osmosis Dorothy she kills two wicked witches and she convinces the wizard of Oz to leave. And then she splits. <laughs> and, you know, it's one of those things that like, they try to try, try to wrap it up in a neat little bow. And having grown up during the invasion of Iraq, I know that's not how it works. It's not a happy ending. Um, it, it would be chaos. You know, that's kind of the, the she was basically an anarchist. At the, yeah. Like... I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of, it, it's, it's like U S interventionism. Where, you know, you sort of, you go in, you take out the despot, and then you think, okay, well, the people, the people will rise up and it will be good. And the problem is, is that the sad truth is all these despots, they're not just ruling through fear and power, although that is uh, certainly part of it, but it's this control. It's a sense of, they, they've got their tendrils and everything. And so if you uproot them, there's so many other things that get uprooted along with it, like mm -hmm. basic infrastructure. And suddenly all these other people start saying, oh, like there's there's we can fight for a piece of the pie and suddenly it gets it, it looks like baghdad it looks like game of thrones and i kind of i, I kind of thought very quickly oh yeah that's the story here is you know dorothy kills the wicked witch she didn't win anything she 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 actually made things so much worse and now it's just kind of chaos and everybody's trying to get some level of control but a figurehead like dorothy gale that's something that could maybe bring some order back. And that's going to be Dorothy's journey is that, you know, the, the being a soldier and being a leader, those are not always on the same page that sometimes they're very different books. She's used to being a boot on the ground. Mm -hmm. And now she's sort of, you know, she's seen as almost like a, like royalty in Oz. And that is a very uncomfortable position for her to be in. You just got uh, a promotion to general real quick. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, nobody ever told you what it was like to be a warlord of Oz. And that's something she's going to have to learn on the fly real quick. I have to pick your brain for just one more question about Please. these classic characters. Let's do it. Now I'm just, the first thing that came to mind after I read through the Kickstarter yeah. description and I saw the varying covers and I read through mm -hmm. the couple of panels that you had up there, one particular person and group of people were uh -huh. noticeably absent mm -hmm. and i'm just i'm either imagining her as the big bad villain of the whole thing mm -hmm. but where's glinda at and is she potentially leading an army of little people like where's the munchkins because i'm just imagining like get them and there's just a yep. dozens of uh, dozens what, of munchkins attacking what i can say is you know glinda if i was a, a warlord of oz glinda would be the first on my hit list and okay. Glinda is a smart lady. And so, you know, while her fate might be a little uncertain, she would be the first to take precautions. And so those precautions are really going to uh, steer Dorothy and her quest in a major way. Um, and so, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to learn a little bit about Glinda's fate in, okay. uh, in, in this first issue. You mentioned the novels before. Yeah. Now, I, the novel for The Wizard of Oz, there were other aspects of the book that were never translated to the movie. There were some that were put yeah. into the Return to mm -hmm. Oz, which was a really trippy movie. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, anything it's from those books that make their way into your story? A little bit. Um, you know, so so for it's funny because like they're the 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 Oz novels are considered public domain. The films are not. Mm -hmm. And so you have to really kind of thread the needle in terms of, for example, the Ruby slippers were an invention for Technicolor. Uh, um, the, the original novel, it's silver. And so um, figuring that sort of stuff out, all the bomb novels are considered public domain though, which is great. It's uh, I, the reason I had read them in college was because I, uh, I wrote about how the wizard of Oz was like a prototypical superhero universe that bomb, I, I, it was a class in adolescent literature. And I said that bomb was building on continuity and mythology over 20 novels decades before Stan and Jack were on the scene. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, uh, you know, for me, it's like threading the needle, you know, there's that core quartet that everybody knows. And, you know, just by cultural osmosis, you want to focus on, on that group. 
but you know, there's a whole universe to explore. And so we've really been able to kind of uh, establish that, that scope of setting. Um, I, I talked a lot with our colorist, Whitney Kogar. I said, what's the Mad Max version of Star Wars look like? That's the OZ where you've got that grittiness and that intensity, but also just all these different types of locales with their own individual like palette and temperature and internal high concept. It's kind of like, you know, Star Wars, you know, uh, Tatooine versus Hoth versus mm-hmm. Dagobah versus Cloud City. Well, Oz, you've got the bombed out Emerald City. You've got the Deadly Desert. You've got the mountaintops of Ix. You've got the Wicked Witch's Castle. So all these different locations are going to have very distinct obstacles and, and personalities for, for Dorothy to have to navigate. But that said, we certainly have some of the uh, ancillary characters. Jack Pumpkinhead has always been a favorite of mine. I love that design. He plays a fairly significant role. He makes a quick appearance in our first issue. And then issues two and three, Jack plays a much bigger and more important role. You know, it's funny. People keep asking me, for example, like Ozma, who is a big character in in the future books. And she was a character in particular I kind of wanted to hold in my back pocket. um, Mm -hmm. Because if we ever told more stories as set in the OZ, she's a character that I think would be very important. Um, See, I don't even know who that is. Yeah, she was seen as a princess of Oz. She would be an interesting character to see how she might react to somebody like Dorothy, um, who, you know, <laughs> might be a second type of figurehead, you know, or they had a, a robot, uh, sort of a proto robot called TikTok. You know, I have ideas of where he could maybe fit in the future, but I don't want to distract from the Tin Soldier at this mm-hmm. point. I've had people ask me, what about the wheelies? You know, those creepy looking. I remember them guys. Yes. The whole series has been written and our first 44 pages have been drawn. Uh, which is on the Kickstarter now. We're hard at work on our second installment, which will probably kickstart in uh, February. Okay. So, you know, by virtue of we're still, the art is still being put together, I'm kind of like, oh, all right, like there might be some room for some cameos here and there. The thing about Oz, which makes sense, it's like any other major fandom like Star Wars or, or Marvel or DC, is everybody's got their favorite characters. And some of them are so obscure that you're like, oh man, like the general populace would not know about this Mm -hmm. but then you start hearing certain things start to pop up the wheelies everybody loves the wheelies so (laughs) i i gotta talk to i gotta talk to ruben rojas to see if there's a way that we can fit them in and i've got a pretty good idea of where we could fit them in um so yeah we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make something we're gonna try to make something happen with that so you've got the kickstarter up talk us through a couple of the prizes because that's what everybody wants out of their kickstarter (laughs) We've got tons. Um, you know, I'm always about trying to get more bang for your buck uh, because it's Kickstarter. Uh, you know, these are the early adopters. These are the people taking the risk on us. And so um, every single tier uh, from $5 up uh, on up, 500 or, you know, $5 to $400, you get the first issue PDF of Spencer and Locke and going to the chapel. Uh, because I, you know, Kickstarter, the reason I did it was I wanted to do outreach to a demographic that I had not hit before. And so I want to introduce the Kickstarter community to my other work. We also have, um, starting at our $10 tier, you get uh, 44 pages of the OZ. It's double sized. So you're getting already some bang for your buck. You're getting Spencer and Lock. You're getting going to the chapel. You're getting my scripts. Um, if, if you go up to 15, you also get Ruben Rojas's uh, Raw Inks and Whitney Kogar's Untouched Colors. Oh, that's cool. Um, that's that's just the digital stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, once you start getting into print, we've got four amazing covers for this book. Uh, yeah, Ruben Rojas. I, I want to get into that. It, save yeah. save the description okay, of the very covers. I want to get into that. Uh, so you know we've got we've got we've got those um, because we've already smashed um, uh, two of our stretch goals and we're coming up close to our third. Uh, all backers will get our digital comics extravaganza. So you'll be getting PDFs from people like Justin Jordan, Rylan Grant, Frank Gogol, uh, Kevin Eastman, the co-creator of the Ninja Turtles, has graciously donated the first issue of his book, Drawing Blood. We've got all those and plenty more other amazing creators that we haven't shared yet. Mm. We've got our variant covers. We've got um, deals involving trade paperbacks for Spencer and Locke, Spencer and Locke 2 and going to the chapel. We've got uh, Ruben Rojas has a special design card of Dorothy Gale's initial design. So we've got a tier for those. I think we have one Skype session with me left Mm -hmm. um, uh, where I'll talk with you about your pitches or how to run a Kickstarter or how to do publicity or how how to navigate Hollywood. It's really whatever you want to set the agenda for. Last but not least, and this is a really cool one. This is our premium tier. So... People have asked me for years, are you going to make Spencer and Locke plushies? We had 10 of them handmade as a thank you gift to my creative team for seeing this book through. 
We have two left. All right. So that is a piece of history. Our doll maker is no longer in the game. So this is it. So yeah, for those who, those Spencer and Locke super fans who want everything, this is their way of getting it. Yeah. And we, we, we I wanted to make it a point that we had uh, uh, tiers for every level of budget, you know? And so I wanted to make sure that we weren't blocking anybody off. So it's like, if you have $10, you get a ton of stuff. Mm-hmm. If you have, you know, a hundred dollars, you get a ton of stuff. If you're a collector, we've got deals where if you get all four of our covers, you're actually getting it for the price of three covers. So we're trying to kind of make it easy on people because look, I know it's, it's Kickstarter. There, there are people who don't know who I am. Mm-hmm. And so it's rolling the dice. And even, you know, with the, with the books that I have put out, it's still, you know, I'm not, I don't have that long of a track record yet. Um, so I want to make sure anybody who feels like they're rolling the dice is getting something out of this. Um, because yeah, every, every reader matters, every Mm -hmm. backer counts. Uh, you know, we've been very successful with this Kickstarter. I think we're at like 550% and climbing. Um, but the thing is making comics is not cheap. I wrote this as a six issue mini. We're packaging it as three double sized issues. That money goes very quickly, uh, towards art and printing. Um, for me, it was all about the readership. It's how do we invite more people to the table? How do we build that wider uh, consensus? I I want to be a 30-year man in this business. I want to be like Grant Morrison or Dan Slott or Jeff Johns. The only way that you do that is if you build that readership. Um, and so I want I want readers to be fans of the OZ and then become fans of Spencer and Locke and become fans of going to the chapel and become fans of what the other books that I've got coming down the pike. And I think Kickstarter is a really valuable and important resource to, to, to building that readership over the long term. I found Kickstarter is like a lot of people who will, I, I think the term is kick in because that's the term I've always used. I love and, it. Uh, th- it makes them feel more involved also with the creation yeah. of the book, whether they see their names in, in the credits at the end or something, yeah. or, you know, it just kind of gets them involved in some way. And if they get all these sorts of, Kickstarter exclusives, whether they be variant covers or you've got some sketch cards from the artist up there as well. Because I took a look through the tiers just to kind of see. Yeah. And I, I'm teeter tottering betw- somewhere between all four print covers mm-hmm. and one of the other ones. But I, I do want to talk to you about the variant covers. Yeah. Besides the regular cover of Dorothy and the Tin Soldier, you have an Akira homage cover. Mm-hmm. You have one other one, an Apocalypse Now kind yeah. of cover. Mm-hmm. And then you have my personal favorite, which is the winged monkey perched on yeah. his gun. I yeah. really dig that one, man. Uh, Mon House is terrific. I've worked with him on every book uh, that I've that I've done. He did variant covers for Spencer and Locke and Spencer and Locke 2 and going to the chapel. He he's my go-to variant man. Um and yeah, uh it's funny. I I I I I'm glad you dig that cover. I actually did the colors on that really? cover. Really? Um yeah, I I uh, Mon just knocked it out. Um, I'm so happy with what he did. I, for me, I, it's funny. I, I had somebody ask me the other day, they were like, Oh, have you ever approached Scotty young? Because he's a big, uh, wizard of Oz fan. He's also mm-hmm. a big Calvin and Hobbes fan. Um, and my reaction was, that's actually not how I want to do things. Um, you know, it, it, first off it's, it's, uh, it's not really cost effective to chase after the big names. Right. Um, but secondly, for me as a, as a, as a reader and as a creator, I always, I'm more interested in like, who's the guy I haven't heard of. Um, who's somebody who's really interesting that just, I, I didn't know who they were. And that was something I've always tried to pick out with the art teams I work with, um, you know, with, with Ruben Rojas and Whitney Kogar, uh, down to our variant artists, which is a uh, Monhouse, Rio Burton and Kenneth Wagnon. Um, for me, I always want to work with talent who's as hungry to succeed as I am. And I think it's, yeah, it's like, I'm always kind of on the prowl thinking like, okay, who do we not know? Who's, who's new? Um, you know, who can we check out? And yeah, I, I couldn't be happier with how these covers all turned out. So who's the artist you have illustrating the entire land of the OZ? Yeah. So I, I'm working with artist Ruben Rojas and colorist Whitney Kogar and letterer DC Hopkins. And Ruben is just next level. Terrific. Uh, I mean, from what I've seen on the Kickstarter, it looks fantastic. He, uh, I found him answering a call for artists on Twitter and I was just stunned that nobody had snapped him up already, that he wasn't a superstar because he's got this style that's kind of midway between Dan Mora and Sean Murphy. Mm-hmm. And he, he's such a gifted designer. He really likes fantasy and post-apocalyptic stuff. And so the OZ really kind of hit him where he lives. 
And so he he has so much detail for the land of Oz and the characters that live inside of it. I had him do pitch pages and a cover just, you know, to make sure it's a good fit and that we feel good with one another. And his main cover, which is what everybody's seeing on our, on our page right now, I saw the tin soldier. And that was the first time that I had seen the character. I said, keep working. I promise you that come hell or high water, I will get this book made. And so uh, he's, he's, Really just phenomenal. And Whitney Kogar is, uh, I think, the perfect person to work with him on this book. Like I said, we I talked with her about what's the Mad Max version of Star Wars look like this book. Yeah, she really, she she's manages to keep that intensity while still like maintaining that sense of like scope and wonder. Oz is a dangerous place, but it still looks beautiful. I like um, how the colors, at least in the, in the preview pages that you've shown yeah. on the Kickstarter, are very muted. Yeah. Especially while she's in quote unquote the real world, like mm-hmm. our world. Yeah. And it really kind of reflects how the original movie was in black and white versus mm-hmm. how it, you know it, Oz or Ghost Technicolor. Will be bang, you mm-hmm. know, yeah. in your face color. Yeah. She's done a really good job at sort of every setting feels unique. And I think that's really helpful. You know, it establishes a sense of place and a sense of variety in the visuals. And yeah, she's just just next level incredible you know she's the colorist of the eisner award-winning giant days so mm-hmm. you shouldn't be surprised I'm familiar with giant terrific. days um but yeah this looks very different from anything she's ever done before but in just a really incredible way and then uh dc hopkins is he's sort of our ultimate team player you know he's the guy who um you know he's dancing in between the raindrops he's trying to make sure that he does whitney and and, and ruben's art justice while at the same time you know seeing okay well where can we put david's dialogue in and so he's very deliberate um, with his decisions and, and he's very considerate of, of all the other team members. And that's really helpful for me. He's, he's a much needed center of calm to an enterprise that can be chaotic at the best of times. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, DC and I uh, will, will talk a lot, you know, he'll send me a screen grab of like a cat uh, of, of a balloon. Cause he knows that I can get a little picky about when the text looks too cluttered. And so I'm like, Oh, you're right. I got to slice half this balloon. I got to cut half the line. And he's very patient and, and generous with his time and his, and his energy. And so, yeah, I love, I love working with this team. We're in a really nice feedback loop with one another where I saw Ruben's inks. And so I shotgunned through six standard sized scripts mm-hmm. uh, for this book. And, I'm glad you brought that up, actually. Sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, like please, people people hear the term letterer and they think yeah. they just write in the dialogue. No, they're not realizing no. that they actually are spacing the word balloons around the artwork and the scene to yeah. make everything con- conceptually, contextually viable. Yeah, it's it's a real art, and it's one that actually I when I was an intern at DC Comics, I thought I was pretty good at most of my jobs, but the one job that I was terrible at was balloon placement. It's a real art to it, and for me, I've really thought hard and fast about you know how many how many panels can I fit in a page, how many mm-hmm. how many word balloons can I fit per page, and then how many words can I fit per word balloon. And my metric is usually pretty solid, but you know, when you sometimes when you write bigger words, it blows up your whole metric. So yeah, DC and I work together a lot because if the lettering isn't smooth, then the whole process doesn't really grab you. Right. Um, it's all about the composition in the long yeah. run. You want it to read smoothly. You want it to be intuitive. How can I get the maximum amount of information, especially a book like the OZ or Spencer and Locke, where we've got the internal monologue running as well. How do we do that in a way that doesn't make the reader's eyes glaze over? Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel pretty good about how we've done it. Um, But yeah, it's always an ongoing concern and an ongoing process to make sure that the reading is as smooth as humanly possible. You know, the Akira cover, uh, Kenneth Wagnon's hit and run cover. I actually, when he, when he sent it to me, when it hit my inbox, I was so stunned that I said, how much for the original? Hmm. Um, because it is just, it's, it's here in my apartment right now. It is just so next level good that I just like, I, I was like, I, we need to keep it in the family. Um, if I have any regrets about any of my previous work, it's that, I let somebody else buy the trade paperback cover for Spencer and Locke volume one. And that I let somebody buy Jorge Santiago Jr.'s New York Comic Con cover mm. for Spencer and Locke volume one. It's one of those things. I think there's a real power to that original art. And um, for me as a creator who's, you know, finding their way, having those touchstones stay within the family, um, I think is really important. I think that way, any member of the team who wants you know, who wants to look at it, who who wants access to it, who needs it for something, we have it there. 
We've got some really cool pinups in store for our readers as well. We just actually revealed today Alex Cipriano, who's a really talented artist. He's got like a Jeff Darrow kind of style. And mm-hmm. so I said, I want to see what you do with the Tin Soldier. And so that's on my Twitter page right now. I'm this really cool, hyper detailed, like robotic Tin Man. Joe Mulvey is working on on one right now with the Scarecrow. That looks really cool. We've got some really cool uh, Dorothy pinups that are being made. But yeah, you know, I just, I consider myself really fortunate. And I think it stems from, I used to be a reporter once Mm -hmm. upon a time. I covered crime and state politics. And so I'm used to digging really works for me. And so I'm always kind of looking for like, okay, who's, who's a talent that I don't know of yet, who I could reach out to. And sometimes that's me looking at uh, colleges and looking at their their sequential art programs. Sometimes it's seeing artists who I like and looking at their friends lists. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's just looking up certain hashtags like the Inktober hashtag or uh, artists of uh, SEA for Southeast Asia, um, just to name a, a couple, or uh, Visible Women or Drawing While Black. Um, you know, I'm constantly looking through all these different things. And sometimes I f- see artists who I think are just really cool and... I don't have a spot for them. And so I just hit that bookmark and I'm like, okay, maybe for later. And I find a back burner for a little bit, just in case Yeah, if I find the right project. And in the case of something like the OZ, having that opportunity for variant covers and for pinups, um, you know, that that's a, that's a cool way to add value for our book and to just build up relationships with more creators down the line. That's another thing I find about Kickstarter is it's a great spot for, up and coming writers and artists to, and to just keep the pun going to kick off their career. Yeah. I've seen, a, I've kicked in on a lot of projects with artists and writers that you've ne- you never heard of before, but you like their work uh, just from looking at, at the stuff on, on the site. Yeah. And you're like, all right, this is something I can get into. And you establish friendships over the years. Yeah. You know, I think the thing that a lot of aspiring creators tell me, and I think you just, hit it right on the head with what you just said. My younger siblings, we have an almost 10 year gap between us. Uh, You know, I'm in my mid thirties. They're in their mid twenties. They're still kind of finding their way. Mm -hmm. And they've asked, you know, I remember my, one of my brothers asked me, I got it. I got my first agent. And he was like, how did you do that? Like, you know, I'm beating my head against a wall. And I said, well, you know, success doesn't happen overnight. Uh, Especially in comics. Uh, it, it, It is not measured in weeks or months. It is measured in years. I've been in the periphery of the, of the business for, over a decade. I got my start as a DC intern in 2008. I wrote for Newsarama for over a decade. Um, those are the relationships that I built up over time. And my first, my first agent I got based on somebody I met at DC comics in 2008. It took a decade for that, you know, and it's just, it was somebody I was buddies with, mm-hmm. um, but it took 10 years for both of us to come up in our careers in a way that we were able to help each other in that regard. And so I feel like um, that's really, you, you hit it right on the head is it's those relationships, it's those mm-hmm. friendships and they don't sprout up overnight. Um, it takes time to sort of build that momentum and build that platform. I mean, when you look at it, this whole interview wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for just a mutual friends list thing. I yeah. Mean, shout out to Brent Lingo for hooking us up. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I didn't even know I knew you. When we set this interview up for the Kickstarter and I looked through and I was like, oh, this is the dude that wrote Spencer and Locke. And we reviewed that issue when it came out. Ramon absolutely loved it. And I told him, I was like, dude, I'm interviewing the guy from Spencer and Locke today. Like, <laughs> and unfortunately he couldn't be here with us, but uh, well, he sends his regards and says, tell, hey, tell hey, him thanks I said, for a great book. Tell him I said, hello, tell him thank you for the kind words. Um, that's the thing is like, you know, comics when done right it's like the secret handshake you know it's 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 yes. the fraternity it's it's all based on like this shared love of the medium and of the industry and of our history and that's the thing that really get, get, gets me out of bed every day is that i'm kind of like all right like at the end of the day most of us are doing this out of love of the game <laughs> even the ones with like the most bad faith takes on everything it's still rooted in the sense of nostalgia of what they can't get back or 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 that they might not be able to to contribute in in a, in a meaningful way otherwise but i think you know most comics people are good people mm-hmm. um and i think we you know we're certainly not in this for the money or the respect or the job security <laughs> uh, you know we're in this for love of the game right and um and so yeah feeling you know the fact that i've been fortunate enough to have books that people get jazzed about 
and like that they say oh yeah spencer and Locke. oh yeah going to the chapel uh hopefully oh yeah the oz y- y- it's hard to describe um as somebody who was on the outside looking in for so long now being a little bit more on the inside um it feels like a leap of faith being rewarded um and and uh, it's it's something that as a kid i could never have expected or imagined for myself it took me so long to even convince myself to try to write something let alone give myself permission to go at this full force Mm -hmm. that um you know i you know i i I constantly think uh five years ago would i have ever expected any of this and the answer is not in a million years um and and uh so it makes me feel particularly grateful for for the industry and 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 for our readers and people like you helping us spread the word um because yeah without any one of those components i i I wouldn't be here right now i i appreciate that i mean the peach basement show has always kind of prided ourselves on being a friend to the indie creator and the indie publishing as a whole because we know the struggle i mean we we started out with just a simple little bunch of nerds around a table talking shop. That's all it was. Just a simple basement. And now you guys look at the basement you have now. Um, It it has definitely evolved over the years. It's true. It's exactly like you, you know, the struggle. And, and the thing is, is the Indies are where the innovation comes from. For me, that's why I'm always trying to do something that's got a universal core to it, whether, you know, everybody knows what the wizard of Oz is, but if not, they, everybody knows what a war looks like, you know, right. Uh, Going to the chapel. Everyone's been to a wedding. Everyone's been in love. Sometimes that hasn't worked out. If not, you've probably been part of a dysfunctional family. And if you haven't, you're the dysfunctional one. <laughs> um, you know, Spencer and Locke, even if you haven't heard of Calvin and Hobbes, you've certainly, you've dealt with trauma in your past and you've had friends that have helped you get through it. Um, for me, as a creator, I don't want to preach to the choir. I want converts. And so I think being able to do that outreach and being able to have accessible storytelling. Um, I've been really fortunate, you know, when in, 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 in conventions, which I hope will come back at some point uh, when it's safe to do so. But um, I have people tell me all the time, well, I don't know. I don't read comics. I'm like, you're the target audience. Mm-hmm. Um, I think everybody has a favorite comic, just like everybody has a favorite TV show or a favorite movie or a favorite food. They just don't know what it is yet. And I think it's incumbent upon every creator to try to invite more people to the table. You know, and for me as a creator, it's nice being able to call my own shots. The thing I love most about indie books, where I'm sort of my own editor, is I don't work on books I'd, I'm not passionate about. Right. I just, if I'm not passionate about it, I don't, I, don't, I don't pursue it. Because I'm the one who's writing it and sort of ring leading it and financing it and doing the publicity. And in this case for the OZ, doing my own printing and shipping. I'm going to leave it all out in the field. I, I, I will not, I refuse to work on something that I don't love. Um, it helps me sleep really well at night. And, you know, I think as you start working with bigger publishers and, and licensed publishers, and then you start, you start having to kind of navigate the editorial pipeline, which has its own pros and cons to it. But I think as an indie creator, you know, I just get to tell the stories that like speak to me. And I know I've done this long enough now that I know <laughs> I'm never alone that if I think of, there's of something that out of all the books that I read and all the entertainment I consume, that I'm like, this is something cool. There's going to be somebody else out there like it, mm-hmm. um, like that. And, and I think trying to find, find our own tribe a little bit. Um, that's the reason why I'm always pounding the pavement and why I'm doing podcasts and I'm doing interviews is that I, I want to find our tribe. And right now, you know, the OZ uh, looking at the, at the latest numbers were 909 readers strong and uh my goal is to is to break a thousand before this kickstarter is over i think in two weeks i think we've got a very strong shot at doing that i think so too um but that's that's the thing is that like i want i want that tribe um and and i will i will write whatever kind of crazy stories that speak to me in order to get that well uh, you'll i can promise you this you'll definitely have one more by the time this day is through, because I'll settle on what I'm going to kick in on. I and I'm it. for sure that after the rest of the pe- people out there in Pete's Basement Land see this interview, I'm sure you'll get more than a few other contributors to the Kickstarter as well. Well, I, I appreciate it because I, I remember I remember distinctly the very positive review you guys gave Spencer and Locke, number one. I, I, I remember watching it and retweeting it. Oh, and, thank you. And, and posting it on our social. And that's the thing that I love about podcasts in particular um, and, and video casts is 
what what you traffic in is investment. Uh, you know, because it's one of those things you read an article, you skim it real quick. And, and, and yeah, there might be a link to the Kickstarter, which is great. But like the people who are listening to Pete's basement, they're people who like you. They're people who trust you and they trust your judgment and they trust your opinions. Those people have no taste at all. Listen, you like my book. That's all the endorsement I need. Um, <laughs> but I think that's the thing is that people who are willing to, you know, who want to watch us chat, Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are people who trust your judgment. And so that's why I, I'm always really grateful for people who are willing to take the time and chat with me because, um, you know, I see this as at the end of the day, comics are about reputation, no matter where you're at, whether you're writing reviews or you're doing podcasts or you're writing books or you're an editor, it's all about, you know, that's what you bring from project to project. It's not about the paycheck. And so uh, I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me about all this and, uh, because We're you're happy to have you, man. the world. Um, so, so thank you for, for everything you've done, uh, even when I didn't have a whole lot of a, a track record to show for it. And uh, thanks for, for, for backing me now that I've got a few more books under my belt. Certainly, man. Thanks for putting out good stories. <laughs> Where If people go on Kickstarter, yeah. how can they find the OZ? Do they just search the OZ and it, it's yeah. going to come up? Uh, and, and a quick link that that'll help everybody out. Um, if you go to bit.ly slash the OZ comic, that'll take okay. you straight to our Kickstarter page. You can also follow. We're going to put that in the description right down below of this video. So if you're watching this on YouTube, just look down there in the description. And uh, you can also follow the OZ comic on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Okay. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Pepos D. It's my last name. First initial. Uh, you can follow David Pepos comics on Facebook. And then uh, the thing I always try to push, if you subscribe to my newsletter, Pep Talks, this is where I introduce, I, I kind of tease all the projects that I'm working on. I talked about the OZ as Project Saffron for a year on this newsletter. So if you want to get a sort of a peek behind the curtain on what I'm working on next, bit.ly slash pep news. That'll take you to the, the Pep Talks newsletter. I would subscribe and, to that based on the pun alone. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I come by my puns, honestly. I'm, I'm actually a Punderdome champion. Uh, for, nice. Uh, based, yep. There are uh, not a few. Lot, there's not a lot of people that know about Punderdome. I, I, I've, I've been, I've been an old school Punderdome guy for, for, for years. Uh, I'll be on their next digital show. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, so I, I live for the puns. I die by the puns. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yes. So, um, yeah, and it's everybody listening. Thank you for first off for listening to me ramble, but secondly, you know, just for your support. You know, every backer matters, and every dollar counts, and you know, we want to sort of build our Emerald army as large as we can. Mm -hmm. You may think, you know, the story of Oz, but this is the story of what comes next. So, um, become a yellow brick road warrior. Uh, I like it. I like join it. us in the trenches of the OZ. All right, man, this has been great. Lots of luck on the Kickstarter as if you definitely don't need it by now, but lots of luck on breaking all of those stretch goals. Thank I'm going to so help you out. And I hope the rest of the basement crew helps you out. Guys, let us know if you jumped in on this Kickstarter. Let us know if you read Spencer and Locke or go into the chapel. We want to hear from you. Hit us up, questions at Pete'sBasement.com, Facebook.com forward slash Pete's Basement, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, at Pete's Basement. David, thanks for coming on the show, man. And I look forward to reading the OZ, and you can expect a review as soon as I get that book in the mail because I'm definitely kicking in on this. Thank you so much, buddy. Thanks for taking the time. Of course. Thank you. We'll see you guys next time. Salud. Peach Basement is copyrighted 2020. Ripped Productions. All rights reserved. So go fuck yourself. So aside from the Tin Soldier... Mm -hmm. The cowardly, the lion. One more time. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I have uh, outtakes at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know. Bawa grana weep ninibaum. Yeah. Weep.